This afternoon, two questions underlie the proposition, be it resolved that the patient be permitted and encouraged to administer his own medication will be explored. Number one, should we be reassessing our concepts regarding the administration of medications in institutional settings? Number two, is there an ad objective way to evaluate the situation, or are we afraid of an educated public? The affirmative team members who will support the position are proceeding from your right, Ms. Lucille A. Sullivan, Associate Professor of Nursing at Salve Regina College in, Provid in Newport, Rhode Island. Prior to her present position, Ms. Sullivan served as an educational director at St. Joseph's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, and as an associate chief of nursing service at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. The second affirmative speaker sitting next to Ms. Sullivan is Ms. Rita Dingman, who is public health nurse consultant for cardiac diseases with the Colorado State Department of Public Health in Denver, Colorado. To date, she has functioned as head nurse, school nurse, staff public health nurse in Alaska, rehabilitation consultant for the Liberty Mutual Insurance Company in Dallas, Texas, and supervisor of the Visiting Nurse Association in Houston, Texas. Welcome back to Texas. Next to Ms. Digman is our first negative speaker, Ms. Rosamond Gabrielson, who is Executive Director of Nursing at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Prior to her present position, Ms. Gabrielson has functioned as a staff nurse, office nurse, head nurse, supervisor, and associate director of nursing service. Ms. Gabrielson is at present the uh, president of the Arizona State Nurses Association. The second negative speaker directly to my right is Mrs. Elizabeth Ann Neely, assistant professor at Syracuse University School of Nursing. Ms. Neely has functioned as public health nurse for the Onondaga County Health Department and is a member of the United States Army Nurse Corps. Interest in this issue is documented by her publication in Nursing Research, January and February 1968, Problems of Persons Taking Medications at Home. And now to the debate relative to medications and their administration in the institutional setting. And the first affirmative speaker, Ms. Lucille Sullivan. opponents and fellow members of the American Nurses Association. We of the affirmative firmly believe that patients should be permitted and encouraged to take their own medications. We believe with equal tenacity that drug therapy is vitally important. Each patient, wherever he may be, should get the drug ordered at the time in the dosage and via the channel ordered. We believe the nurse must know what drug her patient is receiving, the anticipated action and indications of adverse reaction. We believe it is essential the nurse observe patient's response to drugs and proceed with whatever nursing intervention is indicated. We acknowledge that the increased number and variety of drugs of great potency and complexity pose a challenge to nurses and to all concerned with patient welfare and demand that optimal safety measures be promoted. These are our beliefs about medication, which we apply to our more basic philosophy of nursing. Nursing involves doing for or with patients those things which at the time they cannot do for themselves. The nurse serves as an extension of the individual the person who is a patient, and she uses herself to achieve those activities which at the time he cannot achieve himself, 
but which eventually he may be able to achieve. A significant number of patients throughout their lifespan for either brief or extended intervals are in need of medication. Is it safe for them to take their own? Should they be permitted and encouraged to do so? It is our position that self-administration of prescribed medications should be a goal of all patients. Only those patients who, whose condition precludes such activity should be accepted. This position does not establish a precedent in health and nursing care, but it should provoke providers of care to plan and implement on a much wider scale policies and practices which do permit and encourage patients to take their own medication. Unquestionably, policy change affecting patients must be based on critical objective study and comprehensive planning. It must reflect a dynamic contemporary society, and it must apply time-tested but always current principles of safety, comfort, economy, and therapeutic effectiveness. A major issue concerning policies on self-administration of medications is, of course, safety. There should be assurance that the right patient gets the right dose of the right drug at the right time in the right way. We know, regretfully, the prevailing system of administering medications falls far short of error-free practice. Studies by Barker and others on administration of medications by registered nurses in hospital nursing units show one error in six or seven opportunities. A study of patients in a home care program revealed that 61% of the patients fail to follow the prescribed medical regime. In a study of chronically ill ambulatory patients under treatment in an outpatient clinic, Schwartz reported 59% were making medication errors. Of what significance are these findings? First, they clearly demonstrate that the nurses administering drugs in the hospital setting of itself does not rule out the incidence of error. Secondly, it shows some patients who are treated in the hospital setting and transferred to the home care program apparently are not adequately prepared to accept responsibility delegated to them concerning medications. And thirdly, it points up deficiencies in or lack of understanding of instructions given in the outpatient clinic concerning medications which the patient is to take at home. In the latter two situations, namely the home care program and the outpatient service, the policy assumes the patient is capable of taking his own medication, since those prescribed by the physician are dispensed by the hospital pharmacist. No such assumption is made regarding the person who becomes a hospital patient, unless, of course, his diagnosis happens to be angina pectoris or peptic ulcer. With such diagnoses, routine procedure is waived and drug preparations such as vasodilators and antacids are left at the bedside. Interestingly, Davis notes that people do not move into a new role, such as that of a hospitalized patient, as passive recipients of a role imposed on them by others. Thus, it can be concluded the dependable, self-reliant person, or conversely, the irresponsible or the dependent person, is not likely to be considerably more so, whether in the hospital, in another health facility, or at home, even though some policies are determined by the setting without regard for the other more important considerations. It is evident that our current medication practices need re-evaluation and revision, and we need to identify factors which contribute to safety in administering medications. Empirically, nursing administrators and educators have regarded the nursing student safe to give medications when she has demonstrated appropriate knowledge, attitude, understanding, and skill. We know legal and moral implications and expectations of the professional nurse 
relative to medications exceed those of other members of the nursing staff. What is deemed appropriate for the professional nurse is not demanded of non-professional nursing team members, and rightly so, since they work under the direction of a registered nurse. However, at least a minimum understanding of drugs, adequate security and self-confidence, ability to follow instructions, and sufficient manipulative skill are required of any person, practical nurse or other, who might be permitted to give drugs. Can we categorically state that patients do not possess or cannot acquire these qualities essential to administering their own medication? We know this is not so and should like to give some examples. After more than five years' experience in self-administration of medications by selected patients, Flood, a chief nurse in a psychiatric hospital, reports the revised practice yields therapeutic results. It enables the patient to gain confidence and to learn to accept responsibility for meeting his own health care needs. This is particularly relevant in situations in which it is known the benefits of active therapy and hospitalization may be completely nullified if the patient post-discharge fails to comply with his medical regime, which in some instances involves several different drugs and for prolonged periods. In another large hospital, the New York VA, selected patients with tuberculosis receive a two-week supply of medication from the pharmacy and are guided by an ongoing program by professional nurses in developing positive attitudes of taking the drugs prescribed by the physician. In an innovative parent participation pediatric unit, the parent is directed in all aspects of the child's care. Oh. We really are trying to follow the debate uh, form. I'm sorry. Perhaps in the affirmative and negative uh, questions, the rest of your material will come out. Now to the uh, first uh, negative speaker, Ms. Rosman Gabrielson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's too bad, Ms. Sullivan. Sidney Wilberg said that, uh, and welcome to all the fellow nurses, that, and I quote, customarily the patient is treated and supplied with medication according to general traditions and laws. While the physician or his agent may prescribe, dispense, and administer drugs, the pharmacist may only dispense drugs and the nurse may only administer them, end of quote. It is to this latter statement, the nurse may only administer them that I wish to offer a case counter to the first speaker's arguments to permit and encourage patients to take their own medications. I will confine my statements only to those patients within the hospital setting, and in speaking of nurses, be speaking of those nurses licensed by a board of nursing as a registered nurse. In the Law of Hospital and Nurse by Hayat Hayat and Go Goschel, and I quote, the nursing profession is becoming increasingly aware of the need to know its relationship to the law. Most seriously ill patients are cared for in the hospital rather than in the home or doctor's office because the hospital has the necessary equipment and personnel for complex treatments and operations. With more difficult and complicated cases and treatment, a greater possibility exists of, un of some untoward occurrence or poor result. Since claims and suits are commonly based on poor results, it follows that most suits and negligence involve nurses in hospitals rather than, than in doctor's offices or in the home. Negligence is the omission to do something which a reasonable person, guided by those ordinary considerations which usually regulate human affairs, would do, or the doing of something which a reasonable and prudent person would not do. In the one case, the negligence consists of an act of omission, in the other, an act of commission. Negligence must be proved by showing that the nurse failed to use the care of an ordinarily prudent nurse under similar circumstances. Nurses are personally responsible for their own professional acts, irrespective of whether they are hospital staff, private duty, public health, industrial, or office nurses. The law recognizes that a registered nurse's activities are based upon special skills. 
that if a patient is injured through her incompetence or carelessness in the exercise of these special skills, she is personally liable. A person asserting a claim against a nurse for personal injuries bears the burden of proof. The burden of proof makes it the duty of the person making the claim of negligence to establish the truth of the given proposition by sufficient evidence. The patient, therefore, must prove the cause of the accident the nature of his injury or damage, and the causal connection with the act or omission alleged. When expert opinions are required, the testimony has to be given by one who is experienced in the particular science or skill. On her part, the nurse must prove any defense which she claims absolves her of liability. This is one of the key sentences to verify my arguments, and I will refer to this later by stating explicit reasons why I feel patients cannot be encouraged or permitted to take their own medications. A nurse is not responsible for an injury arising from an unavoidable accident or one due to the carelessness of the patient. If this is the case, you might well say, then why would the nurse be responsible if the patient was harmed by taking too much medication or not enough? Because unavoidable accidents are those which could not have been foreseen and, and prevented by using ordinary diligence and which result without fault, I believe the nurse could be held liable if she did not exercise reasonable care, prudence, or foresight and did not give the medications herself. I would now like to state some reasons which I believe are reasonable concepts of why patients should not be permitted or encouraged to administer his own medications. One. Because most hospitals have noticed an increase in patients 65 years of age and older, the census in this particular age group has increased to 30 and 35 percent in any given day of the total patient census. It has been noted that incidents of patients falling and tending to be somewhat confused have increased. The tremendous number of medications most elderly patients are on could well be debated as to the need for this, but the point I shall attempt to make is because of the elderly patient being forgetful and somewhat confused that there would uh, be te a tendency for them to take extra doses of medications. Two, because of the multiplicity of diagnostic procedures now being done, medications can cover a particular condition. This is particularly true in neurological problems. For this reason, control has to be exercised in the kind of drug being taken and when administered. Three, it has also been noted that many diabetics who self-administer their insulin regulate their insulin dosage over and above what the physician has, pres has prescribed with sometimes rather disastrous uh, results. Four, some drugs inhibit the effect of other drugs. An example is aspirin and antibiotics. This could be detrimental if the patients are self-administering their medications. Five. It has also been noted that patients on hormones or tranquilizers self-administering their medications have taken extra doses dependent upon their mood swings and sometimes to their detriment. Six, those patients going to surgery have a break in their routine. They are not capable nor do they feel like taking their own medications immediately post-operatively. Seven, I believe the narcotic issue cannot nor should it arise in terms of self-administration. The matter of control and accountability which must be exerted here is beyond dispute. Eight, regarding sedatives. I personally believe barbiturates are overused now, and having these available would be hazardous to patients. It has been demonstrated by some of the studies done on sleep that barbiturates are not a desirable sedative. While I would have to agree that many physicians apparently have not read these studies because of the number still ordered. I believe we as nurses have to begin to look at this and certainly register control by administering them ourselves using nursing judgments in PRN administration. Nine, our pharmacy averages dispensing 750 drug orders a day. This just indicates, I think, the sheer volume of the drug situation within a hospital. To think of trying to control this situation on a busy nursing unit leaves me breathless and the time spent in checking to see if patients have taken their own medications is to me an extravagant use of time that could be spent more profitably in other ways. 10, the most important aspect of the nurse administering the medication is one of seeing herself in a teaching role. 
As the medications are administered, this is the time to teach and inform the patients what medications they are on, why they are, and what the effects of this medication might be. Because this may not be done now does not mean it should not be done. I would see this as the most important reason for the nurse to be administering the medications. In a recent study of hospitalized peptic ulcer patients reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, it showed that the average patient took half the medicine his physician had prescribed. Also, the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation has stated that patients should not administer their own medications. In summary, and to support my arguments, even more, I feel the legal implications are so manifest here that any nurse would have great difficulties or would find it impossible to prove any defense which would absolve her of liability if a problem developed because patients were administering their own medications. A rebuttal. And the first affirmative speaker, Ms. Rita Digman. Madam Chairman, worthy opponents, fellow members of the, I put down here CNA, I mean ANA. Um, be it resolved that the patient be permitted and encouraged to administer his own medication. <laughs> Patients are already taking their own medication. We are beginning to, uh, to allow and encourage the patient to do this in some areas of hospitalization, as was pointed out by my colleague. This needs to be increased. Our techniques need to be improved. One of the most exciting and, and useful innovations in nursing practice has been the more wide acceptance of the nursing history. The professional nurse can utilize this opportunity to find out about the patient, his condition, his language, his literacy level. She can find out how much he can see, whether or not he can read English, and if he uses a hearing aid. She can look at the drugs he's brought with him, ascertain those he's been taking which were ordered by the doctor who sent him in, those which were prescribed by other physicians, the vitamins, seritan, nitol, geritol, and so forth from the drugstore, and the remedies supplied by relatives, friends, and neighbors. She can find out when and how he has been taking all these drugs. She here makes an assessment of his current and future ability to take his own drugs. Teaching and learning and practice can begin here. The patient and the nurse can discover each other as people. It is quite possible that the patient will seem more like one's own mother or father or sister or grandparent or neighbor with the same opinions, quirks, and need for meaningful relationships. The patient will trust the nurse who was interested enough to listen to him. If she orients him to a hospital system which allows him to participate in his own care to the extent possible, he won't feel like a thing. He'll keep feeling like a people. He won't mind the 50 bucks a day if he's a people. It's paying 50 bucks and being a thing that really bugs you. <laughs> a hospital is the place for teaching to begin. We shouldn't leave it up to TV, newspapers, Lifetime, Look, the Ladies' Home Journal, the Reader's Digest, and Aunt Fanny. <laughs> Years ago, the nurses cared for and took care of patients because they didn't have many secrets to share. Now the habilitation and rehabilitation of the patient is so complex, involves so many skills, people, professions, drugs, equipment, supplies, agencies, and timing that the person who coordinates all these components must be equipped with a whistle and a whip just to keep order. If this is confusing to us, think it was what it must be for the miserable patient. Part of the reason that we don't involve the patient so much is that we can't share our secrets even now. Not because we don't have any, but because they're so multiple, we're afraid to reveal our inadequate knowledge. But learning and teaching in this maze is like breaking a bundle of sticks it's easier if you tack the, tackle the bundle one stick at a time. Not long ago, one of the nurses in the Tri-County Health Department was making a home visit to give a patient an ordered intramuscular injection. 
She hadn't heard of the stuff before, so she and the patient sat down to read the directions, the counterindications, the side effects, and so forth. In the course of the reading, the patient pointed out that one of his multiple diagnoses was listed in the counterindications. The nurse then went to the nearest phone, because he didn't have any, contacted the physician and discussed the problem with him. Physicians have as big a difficulty as we do in reading the fine print. He was very grateful and ordered a more appropriate drug. That nurse won't forget what she learned about both medications. As she does eat this each day, she increases her knowledge and can feel more secure in sh sharing her secrets. Patients today are mobile. They live in New York today and Dallas tomorrow, just like us. In asking various people around Denver what they thought about our resolution, one of the nurses in a physician's office said, people come here from out of town. They never know whether they've had morphine, penicillin, or any other prescription medication. They describe shots, capsules, and pills, and only the good Lord knows what they were. We in public health, in home care programs, in school health, in occupational health, never see all the patients on drugs. They aren't referred to us for follow-up. So we can't enhance their learning, even if it was started in the hospital or the physician's office. This makes it even more important that the patient be taught as much as possible, as soon as possible. He needs to be involved in the planning in his own care. He is going to end up being the coordinator, the one with the whistle and the whip. It's Mrs. Neely is our second negative speaker. My goodness, I just tripped getting here. Now you see how easy accidents happen. The affirmative team seems to suggest that the present system is unsatisfactory because it doesn't permit the patient to learn by doing. Ms. Sullivan has said the patient um, might need knowledge, attitude, understanding, information, demonstration, all of these things. And, that, and her question is, really, uh, can we categorically state that patients do not have these things? Well, I asked Ms. Sullivan, can we categorically state that they do? I think if we're thinking about safety, we must begin to think of these things. Uh, one of the next things that I must respond to uh, right off the bat here this afternoon is, is uh, Ms. Sullivan's mention of the Barker study. Well, this one in six error statistic that was given constitute, to my way of thinking, a credibility gap. Um, this statistic was given by a pharmacist in a very good study. However, I think you would have to read it to see that the interpretation of one in six is, is really rather misleading. Let's go on now and talk about the plan that was offered here today. The affirmative team have assumed that with implementation of this that the patient would take his medicine. Now this is an interesting theory, but there is a risk involved. Both teams have mentioned that patients do make errors. Ms. Gabrielson gave us the legal risks involved. The affirmative has more or less ignored the risks and concentrated on the need for patients' independence and self-care but there are many needs a patient has, not which the least of these is his need for care and protection. To, ju to justify any change from our present system, we should be able to say with at least some confidence that self-medication behavior is safe for the patient. In an effort to judge the risk to a patient, I'd, I'd like to tell you a couple of studies. The first was concerned with tuberculosis patients at home. The authors of this study assume that the treatment could have the desired effect when 90% of the patients were taking their medicine at least half of the time. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could give you that margin for error in the hospital? The second study I'll tell you about is one where we might assume that the people had strong motivation. The women were taking birth control pills. 55 of the women said that they had taken their pills correctly but only 18 out of the 55 actually followed the instructions. 16 of the ladies omitted some of the pills. 
21 of the ladies took extra doses. <laughs> Self-medication behavior is a risk, even for a young to middle-aged motivated adult. Add to this risk, uh, add to this, the risk of an ill or disabled patient who is functioning in an unfamiliar setting. Frances Ryder used Margaret Mead's words when she said, the object of nursing was to protect the vulnerable. Can we say that we would honestly be protecting a patient who may be administering cortisone or tranquilizers or anticoagulants when errors in, in administration may result not only in toxic side effects but sometimes in irreversible alterations? It is no easy task to set priorities in terms of meeting patients' needs, but surely we must select the need for protecting the patient through safe nursing practices. The affirmative team uh, defined the patient and then sort of uh, put a limitation on it and said that the patient would be sort of selected. Well, the question is who will be selected? Just for a minute now, think of any busy unit and try to think who you're going to select. It won't be the critically ill, nor the acutely ill, nor the very young, nor the very old, nor anybody with disturbed mentation or sensorium or difficulties in perception or uh, it won't be the one that's medicated for severe pain or the severely depressed patient, and uh, it won't be the unconscious patient, it won't be the brain damaged patient. Try to select the patient that you're going to allow. <laughs> Let's see now, who is left? 